Are you a business owner or entrepreneur who's had great success in the business world? And now you want to launch a speaking career to share your message with the world. If that's you, then listen up. 25-year speaking industry veteran Brett Ridgway has released his latest special report, Three Key Things Entrepreneurs Must Master to Build a Profitable Speaking Business. To pick up your copy, go to breadridgeway.com forward slash freebie. Welcome to the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgway, where you'll learn the keys to building a profitable speaking business from speaking industry pros. Each week, we interview a great guest who will share his or her speaking journey, identify what their keys to success have been, and highlight some critical mistakes they've made along the way that you'll want to avoid. Be sure to visit our website at spotlightonspeaking.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, sit back, tune in, and get ready to meet this week's guest. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgway. I am the aforementioned Brett Ridgway, and I'm excited to welcome as my guest today, Jennifer Wilcobb. Jennifer is a multi-number one international best-selling, award-winning author, an award-winning freelance writer, and a respected book and business consultant in her business called Your Book is Your Hook. She supports first-time writers and seasoned authors with the essentials for writing a bestseller, a great project, a strong platform, and a well-polished pitch, presentation, and hook for their book or project. She provides guidance for the writing, getting published or produced, and marketing of their book ideas and projects, as well as the building of their platform to raise their visibility to readers and viewers. Also for Hollywood and the media, she's taught classes and produced programs for the School of Visual Arts, Writers Guild of America, East New York Women in Film and Television, that's a mouthful, Writers Digest, Thriller Fest, American Society of Journalists and Authors, the Chelsea Film Festival, and more. She's spoken at myriad conferences, festivals, and events for writers of books, screenplays, and scripts for film, television, and episodic streaming projects. Jennifer is also the creator of the Next Bestseller Weekend Workshop, which is now virtual, which is a safe space that provides writers with exclusive access to the dream team to help them learn to talk effectively with industry professionals about their projects. Her keen eye for stories that sell for both books and in Hollywood is trusted by industry professionals who appreciate her savvy and seeing the many possibilities a subject can lend itself to. Welcome Jennifer Wilcoff to the Spotlight on Speaking show. Hi, Brad. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Well, Jennifer, I go back several years, so I'm excited to finally <laughs> connect and collaborate. I know I've been a guest on her podcast a couple, three years ago or whatever, and I'm happy to return the favor her, sir, because Jennifer has a lot of pearls of wisdom to share with everybody. But as we get started here, Jennifer, I want to talk a little bit specifically more about your speaking journey and how you got into speaking in the first place. So kind of roll back the clock a little bit here, and what <laughs> prompted you to even want to get up and, and get in front of people and put yourself on the line, so to speak? So thanks for, uh, thank you for the opportunity to go back many, many, many years <laughs> um, and roll the clock, because um, for me, when I actually started speaking, I was in a corporate environment, and I was put in situations where I had to present things to people. Mm -hmm. And so I actually got the hang of it, if you will, um, to speak. So I would actually go out and I would speak on behalf of that corporation. Um, for example, when I worked for an investment firm, I was part of an or part of an effort called First Day. So I went out and I spoke with school principals, and then the principals would have me speak to all the teachers. So while it wasn't speaking like I do now, it was still speaking to a large group of people mm -hmm. who had been gathered in a room. And so I had sort of training wheels, if you will, in, the, in my corporate experience. When I actually became an entrepreneur and owned my own businesses, I continued to go out and speak about what I was doing, but what I was doing started to change when I left the financial industry, 
one of several careers I had in different industries. So I know a lot of them. I started in entertainment and uh, evolved and came back to it. <laughs> and what was so good about having that those training wheels was that because I did that, because I was put in situations, I even did presentations to the CEO. I also did present in consumer products. Mm -hmm. I also did presentations to the chairman of the board in finance of the company. So very prominent ways to be speaking to somebody who may not be in a large group of people, but in a group, a group of 20. And so no matter when you're in front of the room, you still have to use the same skill set, right? So by the time I became an entrepreneur, it was very easy for me to say, oh, you want me to stand up and talk about something? Oh, I could do that. <laughs> so when you became an entrepreneur, Jennifer, what was your initial go-to topic in the speaking world? So for me, when I started Your Book is Your Hook, part of what I wanted people to do was a little bit different than what other people were doing in the book space. I wanted people to like writing. And I actually wanted them to really enjoy it, not just feel like they had to do it or it was a burden or it was something that, oh, if you don't do it, time is going to run out. Um, all those wonderful things, I think, are great. And they're true. But the other side of it was, I'm not going to blow smoke at somebody about their idea. If I think it's a great idea, I'm going to tell them. And if I think they should pivot, I'm going to tell them that too. And reinterpret or reimagine mm -hmm. that idea. And part of the reason why I started coming from this place of what people say, authenticity, um, is because for me, I was very honest. I wasn't just like, oh, you should do this. Listen, I make my living as a consultant helping people, and I know that, but I'm really not in it for the money. I'm really all about, all of us love to read. Like my personal why, Brett, is to move humankind forward. And we do that with our stories. We do it because people for years and years and years have passed their stories to others. Mm -hmm. And we learn from them and we love them. And by the way, we read a lot of dead people on our shelves. So they last a long time. Mm -hmm. And when you hear somebody speak, that was what I was thinking about was what can I say to encourage people to let them know that this is fun. It's supposed to be fun. <laughs> it's not something that you're supposed to feel like, oh my God, I'm going to, you know, I have to run to the bathroom before I get on the stage or, you know, um, I can't believe there are so many people here. It's sort of like, or in some cases, I can't believe there are no people here. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are so many different experiences that you have, especially when you're a first time speaker, that they can be very confusing. <laughs> So when you began your entrepreneurial speaking, Jennifer, mm -hmm. in my mind, there are, are three kinds of speakers. One is a keynote speaker. One's a platform selling speaker. And the third is what I just call a business builder speaker. So there's sharing content with the hope that maybe people have what they need at some point in time, but it's about building awareness for their business. Mm -hmm. so which, of the, which of those realms have you played in and which do you like the best? So I've played in all of them. I've also been a moderator of panels and I've also been a panelist. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, within the context of what you're talking about, um, depending on what it is. So when I, I have keynoted, I've also emceed, which is another way to actually speak. So, I mean, I've done it. I've done it for a couple of decades. So, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I've had lots of different experiences and I'm very facile in talking to people who have uh, conferences that they produce. I produce conferences and I also build programs for, and panels for organizations. So I'm on a 360. So for me, I like to MC, but it has to be the right venue for me to MC. Um, because I'm making an all-day commitment. Like a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic, um, I was invited by Women in Marketing to MC their entire day event 
in Los Angeles. And I did. I flew out to Los Angeles and it's a big commitment sure. because also um, then I found out when I got there, so it wasn't prepped, you know, necessarily well, that I was actually going to moderate two panels. So I didn't know anything about the panelists. So I had to like really, you know, when you moderate, moderating is a very special position. It's actually one of those positions where you have to share your content mm -hmm. and you also have to make the other people on the panel shine. Right. And so you really want to know who you're working with. So for me, I do like keynote speaking. It allows me to focus on my message. And that's one of my favorite things to do. I'm not a hard selling platform person. Um, so, you know, trying to like jam people into a program is not my uh, joy and pleasure. Um, but what I do like is I like providing people with information they can use. And so <clears throat> I'm always that person. And when I MC, I say this at the end of my uh, day, I'll say, what are three things that you're going to leave and go do with what you heard? Mm -hmm. Because to me, that's where the value is for the audience. Like we can all rate, you know, I call it hand waving. So pardon me if I'm a little, you know, unconventional, but we can all hand wave at the front of the room and, you know, be boisterous and do whatever. But at the end of the day, those people are going to walk out, whether they're on Zoom or whether they are in a room. And you have whatever time slot you have to make an impression on those people, to be memorable to ask them to sign up for your newsletter, to give them your social media to follow you on, to give them an opportunity to maybe connect with you for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, so that they can ask you other questions. I'm one of those people, I never share my phone number. I rarely share my email because for me, I want people to come into my world. And so, when I speak as a keynote speaker, it's easy for me to just focus on that. And when I can actually bring people into my world, then through my newsletter, they can start to get to know me and get to know more. But my point, whatever I was asked to speak about is where I want them to focus because I want them to be able to leave. That's why I like keynote speaking the best. Okay. So how do you measure the success of a keynote speech? So to me, I'm one of those people who was trained many, many years ago um, that it doesn't matter if the person in the front row fell asleep. It's really about reaching those two people in the back of the room who are sitting in the back row, who were afraid to sit in the front row, who are engaged. So I have, I have a TED Talk that's about a personal part of my life. I was one of 10 speakers at that, at that particular talk. I was the final speaker. I was asked to be the final speaker. I had a 20 minute talk at a TED event and the entire room, Brett, left, leapt to their feet and uncontrollably clapped for I think like three or five minutes. And you can actually see it on the video. Mm -hmm. I was the only person at that event who got that response. That I knew I pretty much hit the target. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned earlier, Jennifer, that you also put on your own conferences. So mm -hmm. for aspiring speakers out there as a conference promoter, mm -hmm. What do you what do you look for in speakers? How do you determine if somebody's a good fit for your particular event? So I do it in two. I do it with uh, feet in two boats. I like to call it. So your book is your hook. I bring in industry professionals. Um, they are the people that I build programs and panels with and workshops. Uh, I also do clinics and webinars with them. Um, so they're usually literary agents or of a certain industry profession. However. I run a platform with a conference that is uh, biannually, twice a year, 
at Speak Up Women, you can go to speakupwomen.com. And there we actually are amplifying the importance of women speaking up personally and professionally for causes they care about and for mm -hmm. others who can't speak for themselves. Um, so what are we looking for, right? So we don't just say, wow, I see what you're doing. I think that's really great. Would you come and speak for us? It's really more about someone getting to know us. Like we have a we have an application form you have to submit in order to become a speaker, which you can find at conference.speakupwomen.com under the contact, if you're interested. Um, we're always looking for speakers. Um, what we do is we have panels and we have keynotes and we have uh, featured speakers. But what we look for is how can you tell us what you have to say in your message and what it has to do with speaking up. So one of the things about being a conference promoter is that we have something in mind, right? And at Speak Up Women, we want to know about how can she amplify her voice at home and at work uh, and her community, things like that. Um, so we want to know if you're talking about leadership, what does that have to do with speaking up? Maybe it's leadership at work. Maybe it's leadership in your life. Maybe it's leadership in your community or, you know, in a municipal way. We're interested in the connection. You've got to tell us what it is that what you do has to do with what we're doing. And it doesn't matter what you're talking about. So TED events work differently. Okay, TED events have a theme. They have a particular topic, like the one that I spoke at was personal history. Everybody was talking about personal history. Like one of the speakers ran from 9-11 from the buildings. That's a personal history speech, right? Mm -hmm. um, but part of the conversation that you want to do is you want to be professional, Understand why you want to speak at that event before you start submitting. What is it for you? What do you see? What do you see on their social media? What do you see in their mission? What do you see in their vision? What do you see that resonates with you as a speaker? If you don't do that and you just sort of throw all your stuff at somebody, I can tell you what we do on our side, on our speaker team, we pass. Mm -hmm. because we can't figure it out. If we see something that's really like close, we'll ask questions. But otherwise, and I'm I'm not, I sit on a panel uh, for a speaker trainer who actually does master classes. And I sit on it with like five other people who run conferences. And we all say the same thing. Do your homework. Understand who we are, what we do, and what the event is about. And then put yourself in our shoes and tell us why you belong there. Hey, all right, great advice. So you mentioned earlier that your favorite type of speaking is keynoting. So give me your three top tips for being successful as a keynote speaker. One, know how much time you have. <laughs> as a keynote speaker, you're probably going to get a prime position. Be observant of your time. Why am I telling you that? Point number two, figure out how many points you can cover in the time you've been given. Don't be a watershed person who says, I have so much to say, I don't think I could do it in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I can do a keynote in 20 minutes. People look at me and they're like, don't you need an hour? Blah, blah. I No, mm -hmm. I don't need an hour to do a keynote. Because I know that once I know how much time I have, I can figure out how many points I'm going to be able to actually hit. Here's a tip. The fewer, the fewer points you make in your speech or your conversation with the audience, which I like to call it, the more memorable you'll be. Mm -hmm. If you hit fewer points, They'll say, oh, that was the woman who spoke about this because I only spoke about two, three points. The person who spoke about 10, yeah. I don't remember what they spoke about. <laughs> mm -hmm. And my third tip is 
As a keynote speaker, dress and be the part. Don't be a prima donna, male or female, but dress and be the part. You've been given a really big gift by the conference promoter, placing you in the keynote spot. Don't be one of those people who is like, of course I'm the keynote. I'm never that person. And I've been speaking forever, right? You could tell me, okay, Jennifer, I want you to speak about this French fry, go, right? And I'd be happy to jump up on the stage, do a back of the napkin, like three points and go. I could tell you everything about that French fry. Why? And I'm not a Toastmasters person. And I know lots of Toastmasters people who are phenomenal. We've actually had Toastmasters speakers speak at Speak Up Women. What's important is that be that person, know your time, make your points and love your message. When you actually get up and you're beaming and like, wow, oh, this is like the best content ever. It transmutes to your audience. Hmm. And they're like, damn, that was good. <laughs> All right. Well, Jennifer, damn, that was good. Now, I have a couple other questions <laughs> I want to ask you. But before we do, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Are you a business owner or entrepreneur who's had great success in the business world? And now you want to launch a speaking career to share your message with the world. If that's you, then listen up. 25-year speaking industry veteran Brett Ridgway has released his latest special report, Three Key Things Entrepreneurs Must Master to Build a Profitable Speaking Business. To pick up your copy, go to breadridgeway.com forward slash freebie. And we are back with the Spotlight on Speaking Show and my guest, Jennifer Wilkoff. So one of my favorite questions I always to ask my guest, Jennifer, is, all right, time to bury your soul a little bit here. <laughs> Maybe share an embarrassing mistake that you made along your speaking path that made you a little red in the face at the time, but a valuable lesson was learned and be something you would highly advise up and coming speakers not to make. So um, I actually spoke at Thriller Fest this year. Um, and one of the things that happened to me was um, I didn't look at the location for where we were speaking and get familiar with it at the hotel before uh, the, I think it was uh, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. I think it was 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, panel. And so at 8.57, I was running around the hotel trying in the like ballroom area, trying to figure out where the heck I was supposed to be. And then I found out it was two floors down at 8.57. Oops. <laughs> so I ran into the room and literally they were just opening their mouth to start. I ran in, I threw my bags in the corner and ran up on the stage and sat down. <laughs> I never got to chat with the panelists. I never got to chat with the moderator. I I knew one person on the panel, but I, I never got to know them. And like to me, um, that was sad for me because usually I'm more on it. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, um, you know, and that's after years and years and years of doing mm -hmm. this, you know, it was just one of those things where it was a crazy morning and I actually forgot the night before. Usually I will do it the night before. I'll actually uh, in the hotel, go downstairs, look at where I'm supposed to be and all yeah. that fun stuff so I can know where I'm going. So don't do that. All right. Yeah. It's important to get the way of the land ahead of time. And, you know, we'll all make mistakes and all you can do is go forward. So, yep. all right, so your, your key market, Jennifer, obviously is your book is your hook or whatever. So, I want to give you a few minutes to tell people a bit more about what it is that you do and why it is so important for speakers to have a book or probably multiple books. So let me tell you two things about your book as your hook as it relates to speakers. So first and foremost, what I do is I help people write, edit, market, and get published with their books. I also help them take them to Hollywood. But when it comes to speakers, most of the time, you're... I'm focused on book for them. The other thing I do in the speaker lane is I help pe people who want to speak become paid public speakers. 
because oftentimes you can go and learn how to hand wave and that's great. And I love all those companies, but they never teach you how to market yourself as a speaker. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. So I have a paid public speaker setup service that I provide for people who want to speak. I also have a marketing plan. So if you're somebody who's going to publish a book and be a speaker and run seminars and workshops or webinars or things like that, I actually help with a business plan, marketing plan, and revenue generation plan for the first year and a half of what you're going to do so you can do it and make money. Um, one of the things about books for speakers, nine times out of 10, the conference promoter producer will choose the person with the book over somebody without one, even if they suck as a speaker. Why? That's what the statistics show. Mm -hmm. Because the person with the book has the credential. They have the fact that they took the time out of their lives to become an author and to write their valuable wisdom in a book. And so they're going to choose that person not only for the credential, but for people's engagement. It really gives a 360 when a speaker has a book. Mm -hmm. Because after I've finished speaking, people want to go out and they want to connect with me, which is great. But oftentimes people will say, any speaker, oh, they have a book. I wonder what that is. And because we have these cute little devices today, these cell phones, we can sit there and search while somebody's speaking, right? And so the minute that you see something, like I have my URL sitting down at the bottom of my screen. Why? Because a lot of people who speak now put it on the bottom of their slides. They put it everywhere, right? Why? Because we're in such a digital world now, we're so much in the virtual space in our living that speakers want you to connect with them. So if you speak and you've got nowhere for anybody to go but your website, then you need to broaden your horizons a little bit. Give a little bit more. When you give a little, you'll get a lot. You'll get people who will want to know more. They'll get to know you more. They'll get in conversation with you more because the investment for a book does two things. For the audience, A, it allows them to continue the conversation with you and you have provided that opportunity for them. In the back of that book, you can drive them to your website. You can do lots of other things. You can tell them that you speak and bring you into an organization or, you know, whatever platforms you speak on, you can also give them helpful resources. Be helpful. Be a giver. The other thing about it is it's a low-cost investment for them to continue the conversation with you. If they go to your website, they'll sign up, they'll give you their email, and you'll give them a little gift, which is fine. But when you want somebody to start opening their wallet and spend money on you, seminars, workshops, webinars, things like that, you've got to get them to open their wallet. And so I always say, which I've also learned over the years as well and was taught, if you can help somebody open their wallet for anything you have, no matter what the cost, they will continue to open that wallet again. Mm -hmm. And... It's your job as the speaker, as the professional, to give them the value for that dollar, not just to go for the dollar. That's not fair to them. You've got to have something of value on the other side, even with the free gift on your website. So do you have a free gift on your website that we can sure do? Here? Absolutely. Yep. You can actually go to my website. You can sign up. And when you do, you will get a 60-minute uh, workshop on how to publish your book. And you will also get a workbook to use for it. So you get right. a double whammy. <laughs> double whammy. All right. So obviously, as it shows on the screen there, your book is your hook.com is the primary website. Where do they go if they want to find out more about what you offer in terms of speakers and, and paid speaking, Jennifer? So you can go to uh, Hire Jennifer, and on there, if you go down to, uh, 
think it's marketing, you will actually see paid public speaking and you'll okay. see how a uh, paid speaker set up. All right. And we'll make sure that's in the show notes down below, certainly. So that would be great. I can give you the exact link. And oh. um, Brett, this is so great what you're doing. I just wanted to say that because for a lot of speakers, when they're starting out, I know when I did, there are limited resources to actually learn more about how to do this. So thank you for doing your podcast. Well, I appreciate that. I enjoy it a, a bunch and I learn a bunch myself. So it's, a, it's kind of a double whammy for me. So, <laughs> all right. So any final words of wisdom before we wrap up our time together here, Jennifer? Yes. You do have only so much life time. Make it great and share your wisdom, knowledge and experience kindly, politely, and generously with your audience. If you ever want to reach me, just go to your book is your hook.com. All right. Outstanding. I want to thank you so much, Jennifer, for joining me today as my guest on the Spotlight on Speaking show. To all our listeners and watchers out there, thank you for joining in today. If you haven't been over to spotlightonspeaking.com, by all means, do so and register with your favorite service to be notified of upcoming episodes. And check out brettridgeway.com when you get a chance and pick up the free report there. But as always, I wish you the greatest of success in all that you do. And may this year be your greatest year yet. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. This has been the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgeway. Be sure to join us every week as we interview speaking industry pros and have them share their best tips for building a profitable speaking business. Until next week, thank you for tuning in. And remember to visit our website at SpotlightOnSpeaking.com so you can enjoy even more great episodes like this one. While you're here, be sure to subscribe via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Spotlight on Speaking Show. Until then, our sincere best wishes to you for the greatest of success as you work to build your own profitable speaking business.